Hello, welcome to the Nutmeg from the Evening Standard. I'm Dan Kilpatrick. I'm joined this week by former Arsenal striker Alan Smith. Simon Collings and Malik Uzia to discuss mainly the North London derby, although we will come on to Chelsea at the end of the show. But yes, yeah, starting and mainly covering Arsenal's 2-1 win over Spurs yesterday at the Emirates Stadium. A big win for, for Mikel Arteta's side, but a damaging defeat for Jose Mourinho's Stott- Tottenham, whose spring renaissance came to a pretty abrupt halt at the home of their rivals. Alan, we were both there. You, you were on commentary for, for Sky Sports. I mean, my impression and, and what I've written for today's paper is that you know, Mourinho seemed to get his tactics badly wrong in a big game again. It looked to me like Spurs just didn't play to their strengths. And that's been a, a theme of this season, you know, not, not setting his side up to um, get his attackers on the ball, but looking to, to contain and counter in kind of classic Mourinho fashion. I mean, is that a fair assessment? Was that your assessment or does that not give enough credit to... Mikel Arteta for you? Well, Arsenal certainly pushed back Spurs, didn't they? But those first 10 minutes, Dan, I'm thinking, wow, they are sitting deep, Tottenham. And I expected, you know, after that opening spell for them maybe to revert to the kind of style that they have the last few games where, you know, Bale's been flying and they've been scoring goals and they've been attacking teams on the front foot, using the strength. And I thought, oh, are they not going to do this then? And it just didn't change, did it? Until right at the end, they're down, down to 10 men. So it was a bit mystifying from that point of view because you saw the lineup, you know, that attacking lineup, Bale, Son, Kane, uh, Lucas Moore has been in good form. And, and you thought, you know, they are going to try and take the game for the Gunners. Uh, and, it, and it just didn't happen. Uh, so from that point of view, it, it was a real mystery. I, I said in commentary, I can imagine Spurs fans screaming at the telly, you know, shouting, why aren't we attacking this Arsenal side, uh, given the good form that they've been in? Well, that's it. Yeah, I mean, Mourinho is often described as pragmatic, but I think pragmatism doesn't always mean defensive football. Sometimes it, it might mean attacking football. It means the most sensible approach to win the game. And I think most observers looked at the Arsenal side and, and looked at the form and, and looked at their strengths and weaknesses and thought the best approach here for Spurs is, is to really have a go at them. I mean, Simon, we talked about Mourinho's approach and how, how, he, would, how he would approach the game on last week's show. Um, and, you know, that felt like the big question. I mean, do, does, does the way he set up yesterday almost suggest to you that this, this kind of need to, to contain and counterattack is, is almost ideological rather than pragmatic, that it's just not something he's, he's prepared to change despite the makeup of, of this squad? Yeah, I mean, I, I sort of felt that when we spoke last week, you, when you watch the Burnley game at Arsenal and, and you, you can see that Arsenal make mistakes in that, in that, as a team, you could understand Mourinho perhaps starting the game like that. But I kind of felt after sort of 20, 30 minutes, you, you would have expected Mourinho to change it. Um, particularly, I thought Doherty at right back wasn't really working. And I didn't really see him sort of the shift to think, look, this isn't working here. We're just surrendering the game to Arsenal and letting them take advantage of it. We've, we've got to go for them. And I watched the last sort of 10, 15 minutes and the way Tottenham created chances, you know, Kane hit the post, Ali went close with that header. And you just left thinking, why didn't they do that sooner? You know, at half time, the game's level, admittedly Spurs haven't played well, but they're in the match. That was for me, was a moment for Mourinho to go, actually, you know, I've got this wrong. We should be going at Arsenal here. We shouldn't be trying to contain them. Let, let's go for the juggler a bit. I just felt he left it quite late to change his tactics. Which isn't normally what we say about Mourinho, normally we know he's pretty ruthless with change that. But for me, it just felt like it was a long time until he decided that he hadn't got his game plan right for, for the match. Don't he was a strange one, wasn't it, Simon? Because, yeah, we could all see he was really struggling. And I'm sat there at half-time thinking, oh, wouldn't be at all surprised if he, if he drags off the right back here. Because how many times have we seen Mourinho? He's normally a decisive manager. And that was the obvious flaw in, in Tottenham's uh, attempts to defend. Um, Aurier was on the bench, was he? Uh, from memory? It was, yeah. It, it, was a, yeah. it was a puzzling decision. It was. Yeah. And then in the end, you brought Sissoko on, didn't he, with the aim of just shifting across. Joyberg was doing it in the first half and that was probably taken away from his game a little bit. So, yeah, I was surprised that Mourinho didn't act quicker than he did. You're also just kind of looking at an Arsenal side that the last two games, they've absolutely gifted their opponents a goal trying to play out of the back because they've been caught under pressure. 
Leno giving you know hospital pass to a midfielder, and Spurs just didn't put any pressure on that area of their game that that would have been under the most scrutiny, um, and and kind of in turn that also lessened the incentive on Arsenal to play out from the back because the whole point of it is that you draw the press and then you try and bypass it, and if Spurs weren't pressing for it, it just allowed Arsenal to almost kind of forget about that bit of the game that, that they have been criticised for and, and that all the noise was about. And, and yeah, it just took away a, a little bit of jeopardy from the game without really needing to. Yeah, and just to pick up on, on Alan's point now, I wonder if losing Son in the first half made Mourinho more reluctant to use a change at half-time and bring off Doherty. Because I think, mm. as you said, he has been decisive and Aurier was, was hooked at half-time with a Liverpool defeat when you know, he stormed out the changing room. So he has made those kind of changes before, but I think Playing from the start was an odd one, but let's give Arsenal some credit because you know, even if Spurs were were <laughs> were conservative, you know Arsenal took to, took full advantage and really took the game to them. I thought, and and the most exciting thing was was perhaps that that three behind Lacazette, that the kind of youthful trio of Odegaard, Saka, uh, and Smith Rowe. I mean, Alan and Simon, you've talked about them a lot, but but Malik, what what was what was your impression on how they they kind of linked up and and put Spurs under pressure yesterday? Yeah, I mean, I think when Odegaard came in, obviously he was brought in kind of just after Smith Rowe had, had made his breakthrough into the team. And there were a lot of people a little bit concerned that, you know, this young guy out of the academy was finally getting his chance playing really well. And, and straight away, someone who's been brought in was going to play ahead of him. It's not necessarily turned out like that. And, and Smith Rowe has been the one moved out of his best position. But as we saw yesterday, I mean, I know that stat's been going around that people have almost been laughing at the, what was it, four chances, first teenager on a Sunday to do whatever it was, all the, all the mm. criteria in the world. But, but he had a really good game yesterday from, from a position that wouldn't be his best. Um, and the fact that they lost Saka at half-time, who's obviously been the standout player, and they weren't quite as, as good in the second half. But Pepe did, did reasonably well when he came on, and it didn't seem to take too much away from the rhythm of the game. So, so yeah, exciting stuff with that with that young trio, definitely. Yeah, and then I suppose the win made even more impressive by the fact that Arsenal effectively lost their captain from the starting eleven uh, before the match. Arteta dropping um, Aubameyang to the bench for disciplinary reasons. We understand he was late for a team meeting and he breached pre-match protocols. I mean, uh, Alan, again, I mean, you were there, kind of covering that um, situation live. I mean. What was your impression of it? Can you remember something like that happening in, in, in your playing days? And, and how do you think Arteta handled it? Um, well, I ha we don't know what the transgression was, do we? We think it was for being late. Um, mm. Which, if so, you know, you're told to be there at a certain time. And especially as a club captain, if you're not there, I think everyone else is looking at the gaffer then, thinking, well, what are you going to do about it? Are you going to make an exception for Bamiyang? Uh and I don't think you can afford to do that as a manager. You've got to keep your authority. You've got to show the rest of the squad that everybody's equal. Um, and it obviously wasn't a serious transgression because he was still on the bench. But he's he's shown the rest of the squad that uh, everybody's nobody rather is indispensable. Uh, and you know it's been said the fact that Arsenal won it strengthens his position. Um, not ideal though is it you know going into a game you've worked on shape and we know Arteta works on shape a great deal all of a sudden you've got to rejig things uh, but you could argue it worked in Arsenal's favour because if Smith Rowe was the man to come in you know, he, did, he did have a fine game didn't he he's understanding with T and he was, was excellent uh, and Arsenal had a field down, day down that side um, Aubameyang will he be back for Thursday, that that's a question, isn't it? Given how Lacazette's played through the middle, you know, Smith Rowe on the left, um, will he stick with a winning team, Arteta? That that would be a that would be a fascinating one. Mm, and I think Arteta's bravery and decisiveness in making that decision only contrasted further with Mourinho's apparent kind of lack of bravery in in playing the way he did. Uh, Simon, Box2Box on Twitter asks, how do you think Aubameyang will respond to this? Well, that's going to be the, the million-dollar question and the key we'll find out over the coming days. I think if Arteta is true to his word, um, which he was, he was quite strong post-match about saying, you know, he's drawn a line under it, we move on, he's available for selection. Um, and if Arteta is true to that and brings Aubameyang back in for Thursday against Olympiacos, I can't really see how it will fester and cause any issues with the Bamiang because the situation's gone. You've missed a game. You're back in the team. 
happy days, let's move on. The interesting thing will be if, like Alan says, you know, Arteta decides actually, you know, Lacazette played really well. He keeps his place at Bamiang. We stay on the bench for Thursday and it rumbles on a bit. That's when I think the dynamic will be one to watch. But if, if Arteta sticks to his guns and sticks to his word and just brings him straight back in, I can't really see how a Bamiang can start kicking up a fuss over that. We should talk about Lamella's goal. Uh, it was a really memorable goal. I think one of the most memorable goals in the history of the fixture, maybe even in, in, in the Premier League. And it, it was a shame that it, it ultimately counted for nothing. I think it's, it's one of those, in the mind kind of goes back to that, that Harry Kane curler from, from a few years ago. And had that proved the winning goal, it would have been a lot more special than it eventually was. And again, with Lamella, you know, it might have been iconic if Spurs had gone on to win the game. But as it was, it was just a, a kind of memorable afterthought. But uh, a question for you, Alan, from, from Henners on Twitter. He says, um, where does Lamella's goal rank in, in best North London derby goals of all time? And if it's not the top, uh, do you have another one in mind? <laughs> uh, well, it is. It, it's it's in the top three, isn't it? It's so unusual, isn't it? I mean, we've seen so many uh, pile drivers from 30 yards, what have you. But that one, uh, normally the Rabona is somebody trying to cross the ball rather than having a shot. It was just the way the ball was delivered to him. Lucas Moore just tapped it and it was just slightly behind him. So he kind of made up his mind early, improvised, and he, and he went for it. And, so hard to get the power and direction the way that he did. So a spectacular goal. Um, but yeah, so many great goals in the North London derby. I even go as far back, showing my age, Liam Brady. It's an iconic one for Arsenal and he's cut in and he's curled it in with the outside of his left foot into the top right-hand corner. Um, but uh, yeah, it's just a shame that uh, there were no fans there. But uh, yeah, some goal. Some, not Meg as well on the way through Thomas Partey's mm. uh, leg. So uh he, he, I mean, he made a big difference, didn't he, when he come on the goal uh, aside. He, he seemed to be doing his best to, to rile the ref to, to get into his bad books. But that's Lamella for you, isn't he? He's, he's never dull, never dull to watch. He plays with his heart and soul, sometimes badly, sometimes well, as he did yesterday. And uh, yeah, that goal capped him. Malek or Simon, do you have a goal in mind for the greatest ever in the North London derby? I mean, you might be showing your... Relative ages here as well. <laughs> Henri yeah. always springs to mind for me. I mean, I can't remember the year, but you know that that ridiculous run from from sort of the halfway line. Um, you know, that that certainly sticks in my mind, and as does Danny Rose's. But you know, I mm. think in terms of technical quality, I, I think I would put the Lamellas above Roses uh, certainly, which felt like more of a kind of a sort of swing. Um, but yeah, do either of you have have one? The Danny Rose one is the one I actually remember the most vividly just because I think it's, it was a bit like we were saying there, the disappointment of having no fans, but that Rose one, you know, packed White Hart Lane, just out of the blue, an absolute thunderbolt. I just remember watching that and the scenes from that was, was incredible. And, and the same with the Omri one because, you know, when he picks up the ball for that goal, you, you can't imagine doing what he does and then the sort of reaction of the crowd being almost stunned by it was was what made it even better. And I think that Lamella goal was actually just missing the fans because I think you would have had the Emirates pretty in a state of shock and the away end going crazy, but the home fans just sort of open mouthed at, at seeing what he did and having the audacity to try and pull that off. Yeah, I mean, I'd throw in, I suppose, not in, not in the league, was it, but the gas going free kick, I, I suppose, is one that the Spurs fans will, will hold. No, back. no, no, no. <laughs> it's a miss kick. It's a miss kick. And there were a few mad goals in that 4-4 game, weren't there? I mean, David Bentley from from halfway. Thomas Rizicki mm. got, a, got a screamer a few mm. few years ago at White Hart Lane, just sort of, a, I think it was a bad touch by someone else, and he just mm. smashed it in the top corner really early on. But yeah, I mean, the, the, as Alan just said, and I think Jeremy Redknapp said yesterday on the comments, just the fact that it's such a unique goal. There's, there's not really any others that... That, that spring to mind like it in the Premier League and, and yeah definitely it's not quite kind of Quagliarella for Italy in terms of the ultimate superb meaningless goal but but yeah the fact that it wasn't in a win um, will I suppose take a little bit of the, the gloss of it when we when we look back Yeah I should mention that the Mello was, was sent off as well it's his first red card for Spurs and yet it still felt as Alan alluded to kind of oddly characteristic it felt like Lamella had finally gone full Eric Lamella yesterday uh, mm. with the Rabona and, and the red card. And Lucas Moura was, was talking after the game and, and saying he does it all the time in training, which, um, you know, players do 
tend to say that kind of stuff and, and sometimes you don't really believe it. But I think, you know, in, in this case, I really do believe that he does that quite often in training, especially as he's um, previously done it in the Europa League uh, six and a half years ago against uh, Astros Tripolis. Um, let's go back to Arsenal and, and, and talk a little bit about David Luiz. As we've alluded to, you know, he wasn't put under under the kind of pressure that perhaps Spurs fans would have wanted to see. But, but Alan, again, a question on Twitter about you know, whether Arsenal could extend Luiz's contract, you know, given that he's certainly been their standout defender since the turn of the year and, and looks a lot more assured uh, back there now. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a strange one. You never know in football, do you? How things have turned around. I'm sure a lot of Arsenal fans now would, would want to keep him. Uh, and I was looking at the past centre-half partnerships over the last weeks and months and you couldn't really nail down what is uh, Arteta's first choice because obviously he's got a few hasn't he with with Holding, Gabriel, Pablo Mari's partner David Luiz lately but Luiz seems to be the um, the regular in there and it's who who else suits him maybe Gabriel is the one obviously did well uh, yesterday but um, he was berating players for making sloppy mistakes when you know sometimes he's been guilty of that uh, he's a leader I think that's what Arteta likes about him you know this is why he's, he's stuck with Xhaka as well that strong presence in the dressing room somebody with a voice um, so it's something I'm sure Arteta the club will think about he, he's still got a good couple of years I think left in him uh, physically um, and he seems to be enjoying his football. Uh, so, yeah, that, that's going to be an interesting one because when the extension was signed, originally a lot of moans and groans were coming from Arsenal fans. I don't think it would be quite the case this time. Mm. And um, Simon, you've been banging the holding for England drum <laughs> you know, outside the, the Emirates with your, your placards. But it has felt a bit like that this season. You know, I think at the start of the, the campaign, Gabriel was kind of unquestionably the, the standout defender for Arsenal. And then Holding you know, felt like he had his moment in the sun. Mari's been in and out. And now it's Louise who's, who's the kind of first choice. I mean, how, how do you see Arteta's options back there? Yeah, I mean, I've put the holding drum back in the attic for now. I think that's going to have to stay in there. But um, I think he's, I think he's almost got sort of two pairings. I think he likes Holding and Marie together. And I think he likes Louise and Gabriel possibly might be the sort of Brazilian connection, but I do think Gabriel looks much better when he plays alongside Luiz. I think just having that bit of experience next to him sort of helps him. And, and conversely, I think Luiz looks better when he has Gabriel, who's 23, you know, he's strong, he's powerful, full of energy. And I think they work very well together. Um, it is going to be really interesting what happens with Luiz because Arteta has been pretty coy on it throughout when he's been asked, you know, what's, what's going to happen. He says, we'll discuss at the end of the season. Louise, I think, has always been very open about he wants to go back to Benfica one day. Um, he obviously spent a lot of time there. George Jesus is a manager there who Louise has worked with in the past. And he also wants to become a coach as well. So those, I think, will be factors in, in what he decides to do. Um, and it'll also be a question of whether, you know, could Louise accept playing less games next season? Because he is someone who wants to play every single match. He's happiest when he's playing every single match. And we saw when he was at Chelsea, you know, when Lampard said, look, you're not going to be first choice here. He was instantly saying, no, right, I'm ready to leave. And Arsenal came in for him. So I think it's going to be a difficult one. But as Alan says, I think fans wouldn't actually be that disappointed if Louise said, um, I'll do one more year at Arsenal and, and stay on for a bit longer. Just the question I'd have with Louise, and I, I don't want to lump Xhaka in the, the, the same kind of basket with him, but a similar kind of story is that they do go through these runs where they look quite solid for five, six, seven, eight games, however many. But the minute he does make a mistake, people won't be looking at those games. They'll be going, oh, he's done it again. You know, it, it's not, you, you, you feel like there might still be one around the corner with him. And um, I wonder whether long term, it might not be the position that's the most priority for Arsenal in the summer because, as we've just been saying, they have got a few options there. But that kind of right sided centre back, if Gabriel is going to be the left sided one for a long time, as a lot of Arsenal fans hope, maybe Louise another year would be a, would be a stopgap there while kind of more important areas of the team are addressed. But yeah, you do just feel like, as, as good as he has been through the last few weeks, it wouldn't surprise anyone if he played on Thursday night and, and dropped a clanger, would it? Yeah, and it's a sort of similar story at, at Tottenham as well. I think Davinson Sanchez was having a little renaissance and then the, the penalty decision, albeit questionable yesterday, is a kind of setback for, for him. Um, before we, we, we 
briefly move on to Chelsea. There's a um, very important question for, for you, Alan, uh, to answer from Alan Miller on Twitter. He says, who is your favourite roommate at Arsenal? Wow. Well, he's, ex- he's expecting a certain answer and he's expecting me to say Maxi. And he was. Maxi Miller was a good roommate because he always made the tea. He was the, he was the junior partner of the two. Um, I had a few actually at Arsenal. David O'Leary was my first and um, he had to get some clothes together for me. I flew to Cyprus on my first trip with Arsenal, but my luggage went to Switzerland or somewhere. So I've turned up to meet the new teammates without any gear whatsoever. So the first morning he's knocked on every door to get an item of clothing just to see me through <laughs> until the suitcases arrived. Uh, so I've had Paddy, as his nickname was, Anders Limpart. He's, he was a good lad. And uh, and Maxi, uh, so yeah, I, I don't know if he's listening to this, uh, but I'll, I'll, I'll say uh, I'll say Maxi Miller. There you go, Alan. I hope that answers uh, your question. Let's m- move on a little bit to to Chelsea, uh, who obviously play Atletico Madrid in the, the second leg of their Champions League last sixteen uh, this week. They're, they're leading one nil uh, from the first leg in away from home. Uh, so Thomas Tuchel's side in a very strong position. And, and while we've got you, Alan, we want to talk about Chelsea's striking situation. It, it looks like Tammy Abraham's out of favour there. Um, Olivier Giroud's been, been in and out as well uh, under the German. Um, and Mason Mount occasionally been, been kind of playing as a false nine. I mean, how have you assessed that situation? And, and you know, should we be worried about Abraham's position, particularly given you know his potential to be a useful player for England at the Euros in the summer. Yeah, I mean, I think certainly the player will be frustrated and wondering whether his future lies at Stamford Bridge. Um, I think we're all slowly getting to know the way Tuchel is thinking, what he wants, what he what he likes in players at the moment. Giroud does look ahead in the pecking order if he's going to pick a centre forward. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's. It might be a difficult one for Abraham come come the summer. If things continue like this, I'm sure he'll be knocking on the manager's door and having a chat and, and seeing how the land lies. I mean, all this false number nine, it's not good business for us centre-forwards, is it? You know, I wouldn't advocate it <laughs> whatsoever. Put, put us out of work. But um, if it works, I mean, he's not the only manager that does it. Uh, he, he seems like Timo Werner, doesn't he? More in a wide position than through the middle. So... I don't know. It'd be interesting to see. He's he's tried different formations, different personnel. So from here till the end, maybe Abraham will get a shout. But if he doesn't, yeah, I mean, it's going to affect his international ambitions, and he'll be thinking about his career carefully. I think. Mm. And Chelsea drawing a blank, of course, this weekend a nil-nil draw with with Marcelo Bielsa's Leeds. We're going to wrap it up there for now. Uh, we'll be back next Monday, of course. In the meantime, um, Spurs and Arsenal both in, in European action as well. Uh, midweek, Arsenal leading um, 3-1 against Olympiacos in the first leg of, of their uh, Europa League last 16. And, and Spurs um, leading 2-0 against Dynamo Bucharest. Um, so what odds on a on a North London meeting in the quarterfinals of that competition? It feels like it, it could well be on the cards, couldn't it? And then we'll be back here having similar discussions. But thanks to to Alan, thanks to Simon, thanks to Malik, um, and thank you for watching.